Good evening. It's nice to be here with you again um, tonight. My, my thought was to start out with a little story. Um, I'll have to tell you, my son came and it's going to mess me up tonight. But I was going to talk about how I have eight children and we kind of have a running uh, joke with the kids of everyone thinks they're the favorite kid. And I'll have to say tonight, the favorite is here. But aside from that, it's really been kind of fun because I think each kid does feel they're the favorite. And I say that to say this, of the churches I've been speaking at, you guys are my favorite. And uh, <laughs> I... Now, my sermon is on truth tonight, and, and I'm telling you the truth. You guys are a great group to speak to, and I enjoy being here very much. With that, let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've called us to worship. We thank you that you've given us songs to sing, voices to express praise to you, that you've given us minds to think and hear, ears to hear, that we can hear your word, hear your will for our lives. We pray that you would... Use all those senses tonight as we sing praise to you and we hear your word. We pray that your name would be glorified and we would be strengthened. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. For a call to worship, I want to turn to 1 John 1, 5 through 7. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie, and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. We could now rise and sing hymn number 104, O Worship the King followed by Worthy of Worship.
I'd like to now recite together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I, I wanted to say my message is on truth tonight, and it's a good example of the truth, the solid truth that we as Christians know. We can recite together these words from Scripture, which is a rock to stand on for us as Christians. Let's recite the creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's join again in song um, number 105, We Will Glorify. to compliment you as a church on this prayer list. I'm very impressed that uh, you take the effort and the work to put that together. Um, it, it's nice to see a church that prays and care for its own. Um, it's, it's really nicely done. Uh, and I'll try to incorporate that into my prayer as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight thinking of you as a God of truth. We thank you that you've given us the rock of your truth to stand on in a world of struggle and uncertainty. We look to you for answers to the many questions that we face. We look to you to help stabilize us as we are struggling with such change in our world around us, such uncertainty. We ask that you would help us to look to you Help us to remember that you promised to be our truth, our rock, our foundation. Help us to take strength in that and to rely on you and to trust in you. Father, we know that you're a God of love. We oftentimes doubt that when we, we see the things that are happening to us or around us or, or possibly in our church. And, and we think, does God really love us? Do you care? And Lord, help us to see that, yes, in fact, all that occurs is done out of your love. Help us to rest in that and rely on that and to wait on you, to wait on your love. Even when it seems like you're not there, help us to know that you are. We ask that you would help us to be imitators of you as well, that we could in, in some way reflect your love to the world around us, that we could love our neighbor as you have loved us. Lord, you are a God way beyond our imagination. 
as we look at the world around us and the seasons and the storms and the power of all that there is, and we know that it was created by a breath from your mouth, you are so far beyond what we can believe and imagine. Help us to just get a grasp of that greatness. And as we look at how great you are, we pray that you would help us to have humility, to realize that we aren't all that much. The fame and the glory that we have is the fact that we're loved by you and that we're your children. But the power that we express is nothing compared to what you have. And, and help us to be humble as we approach you and as we seek to live as you would have us to live. We pray, Lord, that you would be with this church. We thank you for the, the building that you've given us, the warmth that we have here, the freedom we have to come here. We thank you for relationships that you've given us, for the friendships that we have, the support that we can give each other, we pray that you would help us to build this. We pray that you would help us as a church to grow as individuals, but also to grow in numbers, that we could reach out to the community, that we could reach out to those who don't have this gift, this uh, home, this relationship. We pray that we can uh, share it with other people. Lord, we thank you for the many freedoms we have. We take them so for granted. I guess actually now I'm starting to take them less for granted and, and start to know that I need more and more to pray for them. But Lord, we thank you for the freedom to come here tonight, to not worry about what the government thinks about us being here. Uh, we thank you that we can express our belief to those that we come in contact with without worrying about being thrown in prison. We thank you that we can have written word we can hear you on television and on the radio, and, and the freedoms are way beyond what many people have, and we thank you for that. We pray that you continue to give it to us. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your wisdom, your truth, your comfort, the expression of your love that we have in the written word in front of us knowing that they are your words, unchangeable, inerrant, and solid. We thank you for that. We thank you for the example of Jesus Christ. We pray that you would give us strength to follow his lead and to live as he taught us to live. Father, we also thank you for the programs of this church. We think of Sunday school and cadets and gems for youth group, Bible studies, we pray that you would be with all of those that are involved. Bring people willing to be involved too. We think of youth group work and, and the amount of time and effort that takes. We pray that you would bring people willing to work with the youth and that you would bring the youth forward too, that they would be willing to be involved and, and that we can grow them in faith toward you. We pray that you'd be with the pastor search committee in this church. We ask that you would Give them confidence to go forward, to not be discouraged. But we pray mostly that you would direct them to the right man to lead this congregation and that you would be in the heart of the right man also, that, that you could put the right man with this church and help them to grow and, and, and really be a, a light shining for you in this community. Lord, we pray for those who are unable to attend tonight, whether it be lack of will or spirit or health, we pray that you would encourage the church to uh, meet and get together. They could support each other. We pray for those that are struggling with COVID. We pray for the leadership in our country. We think of the many difficulties that, that our president is facing, and we pray that you would give him wisdom that you would help him to make good decisions and that you would keep peace and prosperity in our land. Lord, we thank you for um, the potential of, of saving children's lives. We pray that decisions would be made in our country that would halt or reduce abortions. We pray that you'd be with the, the organizations that are working in that way, like alternatives who are working to 
help mothers to make good decisions to not terminate lives. Well, we pray that you would be with that and um, that you would make that work um, strong and well and that um, great things would be accomplished. Lord, we, we think of this sheet of prayer concerns from the church too. And we think of the many people from this congregation that need our prayer. Um, we think of the people serving in uh, service, whether it's Ben T. Meyer and his boot camp and the stresses that that involves. We pray that you would help him to know that we're praying for him. Give him strength. Um, help him through those tough weeks where they try to break him. Help him not to be broken his spirit toward you. We pray that you'd be with Jim Helmer and his wife too and, and the struggles they're going through with COVID. We pray that you would help the medicine to take effect, that you would be with the hospitals as they help him and work with him, and that you would comfort him too in this tough time. Pray that it, it will be okay. And we think there are, I'm sure, many people, even in a congregation this size, that are struggling with COVID. And pray that you would help them through, help our country through this difficulty. Pray that uh, we can come up with medicines and uh, that the uh, different forms of COVID will cease and we can get on top of this situation. We pray for Marlene Leap and help her to recover from her hip surgery. Pray that you'll be with Hope Wassenaar and the pain that she has with cancer. And, and really, it looks like there are a lot of cancer uh, requests in this congregation. Uh, we pray that you'd be with with all of those people that are suffering with that. Um, tough times with cancer, and it's a scary thing. And we pray that you would encourage them and help them, uh, whether it's um, Hope Wassenaar, Nora Mingerink, Reed Smith, Rena Lineman, Ariel Fox, Henry Teinstra, Dave Van Bunty, Levi Barron, Stacy Leap, Arlene Weikstra, Don Smith, it seems to be a huge list, and there are names that I don't know, but I know this congregation does, and they care for them, and we pray that you would help them through, pray that their uh, medicine treatments would work, help them to keep a good positive attitude, and we pray that you would heal them through this and, and make this a growing time for them in their spiritual walk. We pray for the many people in this church that are, are in service, uh, Mitch Wessendorp, Trayton Timestra. Jonah Wubin and Ben Timar, who we, Timar, who we prayed for already, help them through, keep them safe. There's a lot of opportunities for um, bad exposure to people and things, and we pray that you would protect them and, and keep them safe in your arms, both spiritually and physically. And we pray also for the missionaries from this church, the Shardas, the Smiths, the Walkers, Damstigt, and the T Myers. And we also think of the shut ins, those who are not able to come here. We pray that they can still take part in this service through recordings or, or um, through the uh, internet, however they do. But we pray that you would help them to feel the love and concern from the people here, whether it's Kathy Adrianson or um, Betty DeJagger, Mary Lewis Leap, or Mary Visser. Lord, it's a big list and a lot of people to think about. Names that I probably just repeat, maybe even repeat wrongly, but we know that you know them all and care for them as your sheep. We pray that you would meet all of their needs and care for them. And that you would allow us also as members of this church to reach out and help these people. Father, we thank you that you've allowed us to come to you and pray. We thank you for this gift. It's a command, but it's really a gift to be able to speak our thoughts and our words and know that you care and listen to us. It's amazing that the creator of the universe cares about each and every one of us. Thank you for that. We thank you for Jesus Christ and his gift and the fact that we can come to you in his name. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I think we have the offering now, and I should pray for that as well. Yeah. Let's come one, one more. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give. We thank you for 
Wycliffe and the work that they do to translate scriptures and reach out to people that have not heard your word. We pray that you would help them through this. I know the technology has been a great help for them, but continue to help them through our funds and the willingness of our gifts. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. The collection will be received. I'd like to turn now to scripture and read from the Gospel of John. It's an account that I guess many people feel is an Easter account, but I hope that uh, you'll see with me that it's way beyond an Easter account. John 18, verse 28 to 38. Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken, indicating the kind of death he was going to die, would be fulfilled. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied. It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you've done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. This is the word of the Lord. Why did Jesus come to earth? Think about it. Why did Jesus come to earth? Well, maybe some of you are thinking, oh, he came to earth to die for our sins. Some people say, well, he came to earth to fulfill prophecy. I've heard it said, he came to earth to set the captives free. He came to earth to show us his love. Why did he come to earth? I think those are all true in a way. But our text tells us from Jesus' own words, I came into the world to testify to the truth. Verse 37b. 
Why did Jesus come to earth? He came to earth to testify to the truth. That's something I don't often think of. Testify to the truth. I want to say I made this message because I've been struggling with truth lately. In this world today, it seems that truth is as slippery as a fish. You just can't get a hold of truth. I, I mean, is, is Fauci telling the truth? Are the doctors telling the truth about COVID? Are the politicians telling the truth? What is truth? That's a really big struggle. It's a struggle for me. You know, if you, if you listen to Dr. Fauci, he claims that science is truth. And he's science, so you should follow him. But is science truth? I don't think so. And then you think about it. Truth seems to change in this world. I mean, what was true yesterday isn't true today. It's, it's, it's kind of this slippery thing. It, what the most people think is true is true. Is that the answer? Or maybe what the most powerful people think is true is true. The dictionary had a pretty good answer for truth. It said, truth is that which conforms to reality. I like that. That, that's, that's a little easier to grasp than some of the stuff that I'm hearing from the news today. Now, John MacArthur, um, he's a, a minister that you hear a lot about. He had a really good talk on truth, and I like what he had to say. He said, truth is that which is consistent with the mind, will, character, glory, and being of God. In short, he said, truth is the self-expression of God. I like that. And I, I think you can even bring it down simpler. What is truth? Truth is God. That's a great thing to hang on to. Now, to illustrate that, I want to go back to a story from my childhood. Um, I don't think anyone here was in my grade, but Gloria Eisenbard told a story when we were probably in third or fourth grade. She said that her mom went to Harding's and locked her in the car when she went into the store. And I kind of had to laugh as I think about that. We didn't think anything of that. But today, you could never do that, could you? You couldn't lock a kid in the car and go to the store. Anyway, she was sitting in the car waiting for her mom. And she looked up, and the car next to her was sliding away. And she thought, oh, no, that car is going to be in trouble. There's no one in it, and it's moving. Well, all of a sudden, her car hit a brick wall. <laughs> it wasn't the other car that was moving. It was her. Now, how many of you had that happen where you look out the side of your car and you see the car next to you moving and you don't know whether it's you or the other car? What is the first thing you do? You look at a telephone pole or a building, something solid, and it gives you a frame of reference. It lets you know what is going on. That is the point, I think, of truth in our message tonight. We need that solid rock, that foundation, that reference point, so that we can decide who's moving. You know, where, where is the, the solid point? Where do we base our beliefs? And we're told God is that point. That's a beautiful picture we have. God is truth. We're so far ahead of the world. The world that's trying to call science truth, the world that's trying to call logic truth, the world that, that looks at evolution and says, well, this is truth. No, God is truth. His word is true. Jesus is true. In fact, the Trinity shows up in truth. We see God in his word. Is told, we're told in scripture that it's true. We see Jesus. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says he's witnessing. He's testifying to the truth. And we see the Holy Spirit that we all have is the spirit of truth. So with all that in mind, what is truth? For an answer to that, I want to look at our text in four points. We're going to go long tonight. I usually do three. But the first point is truth as we see it from the Jews. That's the first part of our text. Then we see truth in the hands of Pilate then we see truth in the hands of Jesus. And for a fourth point, I want to bring all that together with some application for us. So first, truth to the Jews. You know, I think we always give the Jews a bad rap. 
you know, we, they're terrible. The Pharisees are hypocrites and they're bad and, and they, they're just, they're wrong. And, and we can't see their side of things. But I think we have to be really careful about doing that. Yes, they were wrong. And yes, they are hypocrites. But are they that different from us? The Jews are called the people of the book. Now, you have to know that most of these Jews that were bringing Jesus to Pilate had the whole Bible memorized. They knew God's word. They were really on top of it. They knew everything that the scripture said. But their problem was, is they looked at Jesus and they saw him breaking their mold. They had this structure built up of what their faith ought to be. They had all the rules and the regulations figured out. They had books of commentaries that were laying out all the rules and regulations. In fact, here you see in the text, they couldn't, they couldn't go in Pilate's house because he was a Gentile and he would make them unpure. I spent some time in Israel and, and I lived with some of these religious Jews. And it was interesting as we came up on the Sabbath, they went around their house taping lights on or off so they wouldn't do the work of switching them. And they were so worried about mixing um, meat and milk. They had separate containers for each. And they had their stoves lit the day ahead so that they weren't working to turn stoves on and off. And, and they had marked out how far they could walk. They went so far as to rip toilet paper into pieces before the Sabbath day because they didn't want to break the Sabbath laws of tearing or ripping on the Sabbath. And that is the same principle of the Jews in Jesus' day. They wanted to be good religious Jews, and they were following the rules exactly. They were doing everything the Bible told them. But the problem was, is they weren't following their heart. They were so worried about their Jewish system being broken that they couldn't allow Jesus in. They couldn't listen to what he had to say. The exception I see is Nicodemus. Nicodemus was one of the ruling Jews, but he came to Jesus at night. He was a little scared about the whole thing, but he was asking them questions because he saw that Jesus was doing miracles. They, he realized that he was getting power from God, and he wanted to know some answers. And his willingness and his humility to come to Jesus shows us at the end of Jesus' life that he's the one that comes and takes Jesus' body to the tomb. So there was hope for the Jews, but I think they had their difficulties. They were not humble, and they were stuck in their framework of what was right. Now, interestingly, this framework that they're so set on keeping really revolved around the temple, and within 60, 70 years, that temple was going to be destroyed. So what truth won, theirs or Jesus? Anyway, that's a little aside there. But my question is, how are we different from the Jews? I want to be careful here. I, I'm going to use an example that I had from our church. At the start of this COVID situation, we, we wanted to have communion in our church, but we couldn't do it because you can't pass the, the plates. And there was all this worry about the exposure. And I suggested, let's do spiritual communion. We don't have to pass anything. Let's you know, just do it in our minds. And, and I quoted an early church father. Actually, here's the, the kicker. He was a Roman Catholic church father that had come up with the same idea and expressed it. And the leadership in my church said, we aren't going to do that because that came from a Roman Catholic. And I think, whoa, is that the right way to be? Is that how we should act? You know, I remember um, when I was, uh, I lived in Dunkirk, France for a month, and we went on board ships in, in uh, Dunkirk, and a lot of East European ships and Russian ships would come to that port. And I can still remember the first Russian ship we saw. That, you know, we, I saw the, on, the, on the smokestack the black band with a gold hammer and sickle and red flags. And I, I was kind of scared about that, you know, Russian. You know, anyway, we took um, Bibles in Russian and went up the gangplank. And there's always a guard at the gangplank on these ships, and they all spoke English. So we came to him and we said, hey, we're Christians from America and we have Bibles in Russian that we'd like to give you. And he had a look of fear in his face and he stood back and he said, American capitalist? 
And I said, Russian communist? You know, but there was this, there was this wall here because we both had our barriers built up, right? We, we couldn't accept either person because they were of a different framework. And I think all of us do that. How many of us think like the Dutch joke that when we get to heaven, Dutch Christian reformed people are going to be the only one there? You know, there is a hint of that in all of us, isn't there? We're right and the world's wrong. And, and, and if we listen to a Roman Catholic, are they going to have anything good to tell us? No, they're Roman Catholic. We can't listen to them. Well, I think that's wrong. And, and I think we're following into Jewish footsteps here. We need to be humble. And we look at what does God's word say? Now, what is the framework of this person? I think we've come a long ways in that. I, I think we listen to Baptist preachers now when probably 100 years ago, we would have never done that. But there's a lot of good that we can get from other people. And we need to be open and willing to listen to the truth as it comes to us. I wanted to just talk about the, uh, um, the hypocrisy of the Jews. And it's interesting, um, they were so worried about being unclean by going into Pilate's um, uh, house because they couldn't take the Passover then. And, and so they met Pilate outside and so they could still do their Passover. But the bottom line is their corruption was in their heart. They were taking Jesus to Pilate and really, now here's kind of an interesting thing. They were lying about Jesus. They were saying he was causing all kinds of trouble. He was going to um, take over Rome. And, and you know, he, they were saying half-truths or falsehoods in order to get Jesus in trouble with Pilate. And they weren't worried about that corrupting them or that preventing them from taking the Passover, which really was the biggest fault that they had. And I thought about this a lot. In fact, my wife and I looked up uh, euphemisms for lying. And if you were to ask these Jewish people, they'd say, oh, we didn't lie. You know, we just, we just presented the facts, or we, we, we had a different perspective than you did, or we told half-truths, or, or it was just a white lie, or it was, it was just a matter of perspective. And, and, you know, we do all this too, don't we? We have these half-truths that we bring forward to get our way. And that's the other lesson we can learn from the Jews. Now, we come to Pilate. Let's see where I'm at here. What do we learn about truth from Pilate? Pilate was a Roman, and Romans were renowned for their legal system. They were renowned for logic and clear thinking. And Pilate fit into this mode very well. They were known to get to the heart of truth, to get to justice, in fact, you know, like they had this whole thing where you could appeal to Caesar and, and the legal system was re really good. So Pilate has Jesus brought to him and he gets to the heart of the matter right away. You know, Jesus, what, what's going on? What, why, why are they accusing you? And, and he's asking questions and trying to find out the answer. And he gets to the answer real quickly. He realizes Jesus is innocent. Interesting, Pilate knows the truth. In a very short time, he got to the truth, and he knows that Jesus doesn't deserve to die. Jesus shouldn't even be here. So the Roman system was pretty good that way. It got to truth. But now the question comes, what does Pilate do with that truth? And to get a grasp of this, I think we need to look at what the situation was in Palestine at the day. You know, the truth that Pilate was presented with, to coin a phrase, was an inconvenient truth. It wasn't a good truth for Pilate to deal with. And the reason is this. Pilate had just recently been brought into this area. Um, the Palestine area, I think it included Samaria and another couple areas. But he was there to collect taxes and keep peace. Now, Pilate is presented here with the Jewish people, a big crowd in Jerusalem. And I used to think Pilate probably had thousands of soldiers around him. But it sounds to me in my study like he probably had about 580 Roman soldiers with him in Jerusalem, a cohort, it was called. 
I always thought he had a legion, which is 6,000, but no, he wasn't that important. He just had a very few people. So here he is with about 600 Roman soldiers, and he's got to keep peace in Jerusalem during the Passover, which is a huge crowd of people. And all the Jewish leaders are here saying, we want you to kill this guy. Pilate says, well, he's innocent. They say, well, he isn't to us. We want you to kill him. And Pilate's saying, well, what do I do here? Yeah, this guy's innocent, but if I, if I let him go, the Jews are going to revolt, and I'm going to have a mess on my hands. I'll probably lose my job. So regardless of what the truth was, Pilate turned the other way and let them kill Jesus. Interesting. As great as the Roman system was, as great as it was for finding truth, the legal system was really wonderful. But did it work? No, it didn't work because Pilate was unwilling to stand up for the truth. Now I think, how does this fit for us? Are we willing to stand up for the truth? I'm, I'm reminded of a time, probably two, maybe three years ago when I was camping. And we were at the camp hosts campsite around the campfire. And a bunch of Canadians and a few other people from the East came and sat down at the campfire and they were talking Trump trash. This is when Trump was in power and, and they were all criticizing Trump and how he was no good. And I remember sitting at that fire thinking, I don't agree with all this, but what did I do? I just sat quietly and listened. Now that's pretty minor, that's not a big deal, but how often do we do that in major instances? I can number numerous times of sitting in council in a church, and, and I brought forth what I thought was the truth, and people would come up to me afterwards, and they'd say, oh, I'm really glad you said that, because that needed to be said, but nobody was willing to say it. It's hard sometimes to stand up for the truth. I think of uh, Martin Luther. Remember, he, he was called before the Diet of Worms, and they were, the church was upset, all the leaders, the whole, the whole country was upset with Martin Luther because he was calling to question the church's policies. And he was called before the Council of Worms and they wanted him to recant. They wanted him to say, oh, it's not true what I said. And it would have been easy for him to do that. He could have gone on about his way. He could have even kept teaching the way he wanted to teach. But he stood before all of those men, just Martin Luther. And he said, I stand on scripture. Unless you can tell me that the word of God is wrong in the way I interpret it, here I stand, I can do none other. He was standing up to the whole world, really, for truth. Would we do it? I wonder. Are we that different than Pilate? It's so easy to turn from truth. Interestingly, by history books, and it's a little sketchy to tell, but it looks like Pilate lasted maybe three, at most six years, and they figure he either was killed or committed suicide. There's a saying, the power of truth or the truth of power. Pilate was working with the truth of power, but what won out? The power of truth. Because Jesus' life went on through the church, through his word, through his ministry, and affected the whole world. Pilate, we don't even know about. So it's interesting. What did Pilate do with truth? Point three. I'm looking at the time here. I'm fine. <laughs> point three. What did Jesus do with truth? This is kind of an interesting point. Jesus is asked by Pilate a question. Are you the king of the Jews? And what does Jesus answer? Jesus said, is that your idea or did others talk to you about me? And I think, why did he answer that way? It's kind of an odd answer, isn't it? He could have said, no, I'm not the king of the Jews. And, and in fact, some of the other accounts say that he did that. And that would have been okay because he wasn't the king of the Jews in the way Pilate was thinking of. He wasn't even king of the Jews in the way the Jews were thinking of. But he didn't say that to Pilate as we hear it from John. 
he answered with a question. And I think that's important because Jesus didn't want to lead Pilate into a half-truth. He didn't want to lead Pilate into thinking something other than the truth. So he made Pilate respond and made Pilate think of things so that Jesus could say, yeah, I'm king, but not king in the way you're thinking of. He didn't lie. He didn't tell a half-truth. He made Pilate understand what was going on. And Pilate got it. Pilate realized Jesus wasn't out to conquer Rome. He wasn't out to raise the Jewish people into a revolt. That wasn't what he was here for. But he was here to be king of another kingdom. And Pilate understood that. He made it clear. So that was the first of Jesus' answer. The second is, he said he was here, and this is the real center of my text. He was here to testify to the truth. Now, that's a mouthful. What would Pilate have done with that? Some, some translations say he was here to witness to the truth. And it, it carries this connotation of a courtroom where Jesus is saying, I have the authority, I witness report of truth, and I'm going to tell you about it. He's witnessing the truth. And in other parts of Scripture, we hear that Jesus is the only one who has seen the Father, the only one who is able to tell us really what the truth is all about. And he's telling Pilate, I'm here to tell you about it. That's a great thing to learn. Jesus is telling us the truth. He tells us in Scripture sometimes, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Always, Jesus is true. He's telling the truth. Interestingly, the next part he quotes in here, I want to just read this. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And a lot of the commentaries believe that in this, he's referring back to John 10. And that's where Jesus talks about the good shepherd and how he as the good shepherd calls his sheep, his sheep hear his voice and follow him. It's kind of an interesting story, but I've seen shepherds in Israel, and that is what happens. There can be like three or four flocks together, and one of the shepherds will separate out and call, and just his sheep will come. The other sheep will be left behind. You think, how is that shepherd ever going to separate all of the sheep? But the sheep do it because they know the voice of their shepherd, and they'll follow him. I don't know if that's quite true with cows or pigs, but no. Nah. <laughs> But I thought, what an interesting point. And Jesus is saying, my sheep hear me. They hear the truth, and they'll listen to it and obey it. And now I find it very interesting. How does Pilate respond? He doesn't hear Jesus, does he? His answer is, what is truth? And he walks away. So Pilate was not one of his sheep, and he wasn't even willing to give Jesus ear. He didn't stop to listen to the answer that Jesus could have given what is truth? Well, what can we learn about truth from Jesus? I think there's the old adage, speak the truth in love lovingly, because many of us are tempted to tell the half truth. Many of us are tempted to fib, to tell the lie, whatever euphemism you want to use to serve our ends. And we see that Jesus was unwilling. He wanted Pilate to clearly understand what was before him, to present the truth clearly. And I think that's an important thing for us to learn and to go away with. But now, 10 minutes for application. What do I do with this? I started this message because I struggled with truth. I struggled with all of the falsehoods and truth that were in my world today. And I thought, I can get the answers. And I'm sorry to say I don't. I still can't tell if Fauci's lying or telling the truth. I still can't tell how many politicians are lying and how many are true. And it, it bothers me and it, I struggle with it. But what did I learn? Well, I learned from the Jews that I have to be humble in my acceptance of God's truth. I have to be careful not to rely on the framework of my religion, but to rely on God's word. I learned from the... Um, from Pilate, that I have to serve truth even when it's inconvenient, to stand strong for the truth, 
to be willing to fight the world, uh, much as the, uh, the guy in the emperor's new clothes. You know, he said, <laughs> all these people were raving about the great new outfit the emperor was wearing and when he had nothing on. And one little boy was willing to stand up for the truth and say, I don't see anything. And it changed the world. Everybody agreed then. Finally, they could see the truth. We need to be that boy. That's what I learned. I learned, most importantly, that truth is fixed and solid. In a world that changes truth all the time, what's true today isn't true tomorrow. As you listen to the news and as you listen to scientific reports, it's changing all the time. But we as Christians are given a solid rock to stand on, God's word, his spirit, the life of Jesus Christ. That is our truth. What an advantage we have as Christians to stand on that in a world that is, is at ease and, and unknown and, and floundering. We can stand strong. And I think we need to be that light to our community, a light bearing truth. It's a good thing. But the most important thing I learned was not even in this text. And I find it interesting. Um, I, I meant to tell you this earlier. Truth in John is a major theme. And not just the book of John, but the epistles of John also, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. John has truth as one of his, I think there's three central themes in the book, but truth is one of the major ones. And the word truth occurs, I think, 25 times in the book of John. In the book of 1st John, nine times, second John, five times, and third John, which is just one chapter long, six times the word truth. And all of those things kind of agree with this whole idea of truth that I've been talking about. But I want to read from second John and the story we have of truth there. Second John, two, or I'm sorry, first John, first John two, three through six. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Now, as you think on that text... I come up with this concept, and I think this is crucial. We aren't called as Christians to figure out whether Fauci is lying or telling the truth. We're called as Christians to do the truth. That's an interesting concept. Do the truth. And what is it to do the truth? This scripture is telling us, and it really comes through all of scripture, to do the truth is to do what God wants us to do. Conform to God's image. Do his work. That's the truth. And what is that? Put simply, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. As slippery as truth can be, that is not slippery. We are called to be God's emissaries to be workers of truth, to do truth. And that's the challenge I went away with. More than worrying about whether someone else is a liar, worry about, am I living God's truth? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your challenges. We thank you for the rock that you are for us, the solid ground that we can look on in a world that is shimmering and shifting and changing all the time. Help us to be good children of yours, relying on you and following your truth. Amen. I talked about Martin Luther in my message, and I, I thought let's end with one of his songs and think about the strong pillar of truth that he was. We're going to turn to a mighty fortress is our God, and I think we're going to split the verses up some.
for our benediction, I want to read again the same text I read a minute ago, 1 John 2, 3 through 6. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we are to know him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Amen.